Hello and welcome to Global Eye. With the union bed budget less than a month away, there is a common ask among India's trading partners. Ease of doing business and reduction in tariffs. The UK-India Business Council is hoping that the Indian government will reduce tariffs with alcohol, food and healthcare sector. This comes as a free trade agreement is being drawn up by the two countries. However, the US-India Business Council has asked the Indian government to make India an attractive destination for US investors along with making a standardized process for reforms as well. So will all these demands be considered and how will this benefit India in the long run? To answer that and more, we're now joined by Alexander Slater, the new Managing Director at US India Business Council and also Richard McCullum, Group CEO of UK IBC. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us here on Global Eye. Alexander, uh, congratulations on your new role. If I could begin by asking you about some of your recommendations and negotiations with the Indian government. One of the points that uh, US IBC and US businesses have been highlighting over the past few months is more regulatory stability and standardized and predictable process of consultation for reforms. Which would be some of these practices or some of these regulations that you would like to outline for us? Thanks, Perchit. Uh, I really appreciate the kind wishes on my new role and also for the opportunity to speak about these issues here tonight. Let me first start by saying that I think that the government of India is a wonderful partner uh, for businesses wanting to set up shop in India and, and wanting to expand their market presence. Uh, I think that regulators make themselves accessible uh, and really do try and put in place rules and frameworks that can help adopt uh, sorry, to help advance goals like growing the economy, creating jobs, and making India uh, an export hub for the world. One of the ways that they can improve on doing this to help businesses is truly to adopt a consistent approach to engagement. The way that works is that they make sure that there's a framework for engaging that is uh, timely, uh, that is predictable, uh, and that is regularized so that folks don't, um, let's say, get a new framework uh, on a Friday night uh, and have uh, Monday till Monday to respond, for example. Uh, and so we really hope that uh, mm. making sure that there's a, a continued commitment to engaging uh, across all sectors on new frameworks and regulations, that it's done in a transparent manner, uh, and that it's done in a predictable manner. Uh, will really help make India a more attractive place to do business for our members. Right. Uh, let me also get in Richard McCullum, who's appearing on Global Live for the first time. Richard, welcome to the show. Uh, let me begin by asking you about the key budget priorities that uh, UK IBC would like to lay out for UK businesses. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's lovely to be here. Um, Look, the, the, the relationship between the UK and India, the economic relationship is, is vast and comprehensive, uh, operating across a range of sectors from digital and data services to food and drink all the way through to, to uh, aerospace and defence. And our members uh, drive that agenda. But in terms of sort of themes, we're currently very focused on uh, technological collaboration because I firmly believe that, you know, the UK, UK tech can support India's push for self-reliance. Uh, supply chain integration, and we're encouraging UK firms to keep India front of mind as they diversify their, their supply chains, and ongoing policy advocacy to reform the operating environment in, in terms of EODB measures in both countries, I, I should say. Um, obviously, we've got a, um, an FTA coming up, and I can talk about that in a, in a minute as well. But in terms of the budget priorities, I think there are three that our members want to see. Um, one is tariffs. So, um, uh, um, you know, um, uh, reducing tariffs in a, in, a, in, a, in a relatively limited range of sectors. Um, but on the, um, the, the wider budget, I think, uh, in terms of specifics, um, we'll see we have a detailed submission document, uh, but to draw out a couple of areas. Um, one is to, uh, to incentivize foreign companies in the insurance and banking sectors uh, to invest more in India. We continue to recommend that, that uh, the corporate tax rate for foreign uh, companies in those sectors be at par with domestic companies. It's currently approximately 44% compared to 25%. Uh, 
uh, and you know, globally general practice is to have parity for corporate tax rates across all companies. Uh, and that's true of BRICS countries as well as OECD countries. And the other topic to draw out from our submission is, is priority sector lending. So foreign banks, um, you know, they understand, they support the, the guidelines behind PSL lending. But we'd like to see changes that allow banks to stimulate and grow in sectors where they have the greatest expertise, um, areas such as sustainable finance, infrastructure financing, and investment in sovereign green bonds. Hmm. Right. Those are important measures, and we will discuss that in detail. But when it comes to the tax structure, uh, uh, Alexander, there have been several key asks of foreign investors for more uh, consistency, more predictability in the tax regime, as well as tax concessions for uh, foreign businesses. Any that you would like to prioritize on this discussion? Sure. Uh, I think that... Uh that there, this falls into two categories. One is about tax administration, and one is about sort of tax policy. So on the tax administration side, you know, many of the foreign investors that India is trying to attract are multinational companies. And the way that they uh, operate are through shared services agreements, where uh, effectively one part of the business delivers services to the other part in India. And uh, often there's uncertainty about how there's going to be uh, the, the taxation of applying to these services is going to be administered. Um, what companies do is they enter into advanced pricing agreements with the government to really have clarity and transparency on how that works. Now, India has a process for allowing this to happen, but uh, approving those uh, advanced pricing agreements is a slow and cumbersome process. So we really hope that the government will accelerate the way that it does that. Um, when it comes to tax rates, tax uh, applicability, um, we really think that uh, what India really helped India achieve its goals is to make sure that the tax regimes and customs regimes in place align with its goal of becoming a global export hub for the world. So what does that mean? Specifically, if you have intermediate inputs that you need to bring into the country uh, in order to uh, do high value manufacturing, which is going to raise wages and create jobs for people, but you then would then export those finished goods, you don't tax those intermediate goods um, at a high rate because you actually want to make it easier for them to come into the country. In addition, you want to make sure that the uh, taxation of uh, the service for exporting and importing those goods, uh, like air freight uh, or any type of freight, international freight, for example, is not taxed at a high rate and is probably not taxed at all uh, because that just makes it uh, raises the cost of logistics. Right. Again, uh, that is a that's an important point on uh, tariffs there as well. And speaking about tariffs in particular, and Richard, if I would request you to break it down for us. Uh, would, would, what, which would be the key product line sectors where you would want tra uh, tariff concessions going forward? Uh, and the reason I'm asking you is because this is the last full budget before the next general election. Uh, there is also a clamor for higher import duties across the board for greater reliance, higher import duties from goods coming in from China. What would be your view on tariff reduction and which sectors specifically? Uh, yeah, well, look, um, as you know, we're, uh, we just had the sixth round of uh, negotiations for our FTA. We completed it back in December. Um, everyone involved in that is working really hard. Um, most importantly, there's lots of political will to get it done. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for businesses from both countries, there are, there are kind of three key priorities, one of which is tariffs, um, but not the only one. Um, so in terms of tariffs, reducing tariffs in a relatively limited range of sectors, including um, alcoholic spirits, food, and in the healthcare sector. Um, but it's not just about that for us. It's also about um, standards and customs procedures. So, you know, reducing non-tariff barriers for goods trade, uh, for example, by aligning standards and simplifying customs procedures. Uh, and also very important for our members is uh, mm. IP protection and data protection, because, you know, if you want to drive the innovative, digitally driven industries that, that we think will underpin this relationship in the future, you need to be thinking about those things. Right. Uh, coming back to uh, Alexander at this point. Uh, Alexander, there have been a range of issues that US and India have been negotiating. Uh, any measures when it comes to judicial reforms, regulatory reforms uh, that you would be seeking from the Indian government? 
Uh, sure. One of the ways that I think um, uh, India can advance its foreign investment goals is to finalize the rules for overseas direct listings. You know, India has some of the greatest uh, startup companies in the world. It's got a very dynamic startup ecosystem. Um, it's got a law in the books that uh, allows for direct overseas listings. But in order for that to become actionable, in order for uh, Indian companies to raise capital overseas in a relatively smooth fashion, uh, these uh, rules that implement that law have to be finalized. And um, it's been some time, actually, over a year uh, since those rules have uh, so been waiting on those rules. And we're really looking forward to seeing them. Uh, right. I, I would also like to ask you about some other measures when it comes to uh, increasing investments. A lot of the investments from the United States, especially when it comes to the China plus one strategy, Alexander, we see that going towards Vietnam because it offers FTAs. It has FTAs with over 50 economies, a very strong electronics manufacturing base as well. If India has to win this race, because it's widely believed that the China plus one opportunity will not be there forever, uh, and the time is ticking. So what can we do to seize the opportunity and the budget if it wants to uh, help global businesses come to India, set up shops, set up manufacturing? What more can be done? This is a great question. I really do think you've hit the nail on the head here. India has a golden moment right now. Uh, we're almost at th the three-year anniversary of, of COVID, really, uh, uh, which is obviously not something that is something to mark in a, in a happy way but it is something that has shown the world that it's uh, imprudent to put all of your eggs in one basket. And so diversification really is the name of the game. Now, when I look at our schedule for the upcoming year, uh, one of the things that I think is so impressive is that the planned visits or the visits that have already happened or are happening and are going to happen of CEOs of American companies to India um, are substantial. And what I think this shows is that Companies are really kicking the tires on India as a potential source uh, of French join. Uh, you know, Secretary uh, of Treasury Janet Yellen was here in November of last year. She talked about the French join initiatives that go on between the U.S. and India. Uh, many of the companies that are part of this network are Indian companies. Uh, they do great work in places uh, in sectors like healthcare, digital transformation, uh, and uh, fiber optic equipment. Uh, but the way that India can really uh, ramp up investment from foreign companies uh, to take advantage of this is to open up its domestic market uh, and make sure there's a level playing field for doing business here. Um, the reason for this is that, look, India is in a competitive environment with Mexico and Vietnam for being a diversification uh, site uh, when it comes to supply chains. But what companies really want when it comes to India, what distinguishes India from these other companies is the size of its domestic market and the future growth opportunities there. India is the, going to be the fastest growing large economy in the world this year, 2023, and it's projected to be the fastest growing large economy in the world next year. CEOs know this, right? And so if what you want to do is make this a place for global manufacturing, you have to also give the carrot of making the domestic market a place where these products can enter, uh, and, and be distributed. So again, um, making it a level playing field here to do business uh, and making sure that there's full market access uh, for things like government procurement um, will really go a long way towards promoting um, India as a supply chain diversification site. Right. Uh, Richard, my final question to you, and this would be the same. Uh, China plus one, how can India take advantage of that what is missing when we compare it to Vietnam and other Southeast Asian economies? Yeah, good question. Thank you. Look, um, to be frank, I mean, among our members, and we survey this, um, multinationals within our membership are more optimistic than ever about investing in India. I mean, perhaps that's driven by uh, COVID's disruption of supply chains. Uh, and I think the government in India is, is rightly encouraging investment by by building world-class infrastructure and continuing to reform its operating environment. But we're seeing an increase in the level of interest among our companies who want to look at diversifying into India. Um, at the same time, I think we in the UK have, a, have more to do to update people's awareness about India's tremendous rise in relevance in this space. I mean, this is my 18th year living and working in India, and I spent a lot of that time <coughs> trying to persuade people in the UK and companies in, Indi in the UK that this 21st century will, will eventually become the Indian century. And actually, I think it's arrived, you know, starting now with an, with an Indian decade. 
Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a tangible and tremendous confidence about India right now. Um, and we need to make that clear to companies in the UK. Um, and I think the FCA gives us a really great opportunity to do just that. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Richard McCullum, Alexander Slater, for joining us here on Global Eye, giving us your view on Budget 2023 and what India can do to seize the China Plus One opportunity. We're heading into a short break here on Global Eye, but don't go anywhere. COVID cases continue to surge in China as WHO warns the country is underrepresenting the actual number of cases and deaths. A discussion with Anand Krishnan of the Hindu and Chinese human rights activist Jennifer Zeng on the other side. Welcome back. Amid growing concerns expressed by countries and WHO over the raging COVID surge in China, the country's foreign ministry came out in defense of its handling of the situation. This comes after WHO chief warned that China is underreporting actual number of infections, hospitalizations and deaths. Foreign ministry spokesperson uh, addressed a press briefing in Beijing where he said that the country was transparent in sharing data with WHO that China has relaxed its restrictions despite the spike in cases. Several nations, including India and the European Union, are tightening norms for travellers coming in from China. Let's open this up to Anand Krishnan, China correspondent of The Hindu, Jennifer Zeng, Chinese human rights activist. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Jennifer, if I could begin with you. The WHO has warned the world that China is underrepresenting the number of cases of COVID and the deaths resulting from it. Uh, according to you, what uh, could be the extent of the COVID situation, the COVID outbreak that we're now seeing in China? Yes, I think many um, Chinese experts or observers have made uh, this conclusion or observation that the official CCP number sometimes could be 10,000 less than the real number. So according now, you know, the National Health uh, Commission of China has stopped releasing COVID-related figures. Now many provinces are releasing their own figures based on survey because they've stopped doing the test. So according to the survey, survey of many uh, provinces, at least in Sichuan province, uh, they, they openly uh, admitted that, that the infection rate is almost, is already over uh, 60 and now, and, uh, and that was uh, several days ago, so now it could be over 80. And also from many, you know, many people who share their individual knowledges about what they know about the affection uh, situation around them. So now it is widely I believe that the average infection rate of the entire population could be somewhere between 60 to 80, even to 90 percent of the population. All right. Uh, let me just take that to Anant Krishnan as well. Anant, uh, what are the numbers that have been shared by the government, by the Chinese government in their daily briefings? What is the latest number of deaths uh, and the number of COVID cases? And are you actually seeing hospitals, the healthcare system, getting overwhelmed? Pariksha, just to give you a sense of the situation here in Beijing, uh, it seems to me that uh, the peak has passed in major cities, including Beijing, uh, and surveys that institutions here <laughs> have conducted, including, for instance, uh, schools, uh, have estimated as high as 70% of people in Beijing, uh, as a minimum, already infected in the past uh, one month. Uh, there is no uh, credible data on daily cases because they've stopped testing. Uh, there's also no credible data on daily deaths uh, because the criteria uh, for COVID deaths, uh, as the WHO said, is too narrow. Uh, and many elderly deaths that even we have heard of here haven't been classified as being caused by COVID because they have underlying conditions. But what I can tell you, Parikshit, is that even if... Um, I think the chaos that we saw from two weeks ago is somewhat eased because the peak has passed. Uh, it's very clear that there's been a huge number of elderly deaths uh, from what you see from crematoria in Beijing and other cities in China. Mm. Uh, recently, Parikshit, someone that I know who lost a relative in Beijing was telling me 
that there's a waiting period right now in the Chinese capital for 10 days uh, for having a body cremated. Uh, and that's because crematoriums are pretty much working over time. So there's no doubt that there's a huge number of elderly deaths, given that there are 12 million uh, Chinese above the age of 80 who haven't completed three doses that are needed to prevent hospitalization and death. Mm. And the numbers, of course, aren't reflecting mm. what you're seeing among elderly deaths. There's no doubt about it. And the second worry, Pariksh, is right now is when though the peak has passed and you're seeing some normalcy in cities like Beijing, traffic is back, <clears throat> restaurants are full again. The problem now, Parikshit, is that uh, there's a fear of these infections spreading to rural areas because many Chinese will be going home for the Chinese New Year holiday on January 20th onwards. Uh, and even though uh, resources in Beijing have been stretched, the situation will be far worse in smaller towns, which have nowhere near the hospital infrastructure mm -hmm. that even big cities, which have been overwhelmed, uh, have. So I think the next one month, mm -hmm. two months is going to be a very uh, rocky period here in China, Parikshit. Right. Uh, uh, Jennifer, to come back to you, uh, as Anant was pointing out, and Anant is reporting from Beijing, that there is a fear now of the COVID outbreak spreading to the rural areas. Which parts of China, according to you, have been the worst affected so far? Uh, according to the internal uh, uh, document of the National Health uh, Commission, of course, that's not openly uh, uh, published. I, I think they initially uh, uh, said Beijing and Sichuan province as the most, you know, heavily uh, affected uh, provinces or cities. From what I see on social media, I think a lot of cities have already been affected, like Sichuan province, Henan, Hunan, and even to the southern part of Guangdong. Uh, and Fujian, that's the most southern part of China. Of, all, of course, the situation in the northeast China was very worse, from uh, very bad from the very beginning. So it seems like um, the entire China is affected or is and, uh, in a very quickly fashion. And that is another problem that I think puzzled many people in China. Now, I, I, I do agree that the situation in the countryside would be much, much worse than the, in the big cities because the lack of uh, the, the conditions and the medical resources. And they, in the past few days, I've shared some videos of, you know, in the countryside, people have already burned the dead bodies, uh, in, you know, in the open and also uh, like in yesterday, I shared one video of in on a very short street, there were at least eight families held in funeral uh, services for their loved ones. So in the, that condense, it's only maybe about less than 500 meters distance. Eight families were holding, um, you know, funerals to their families. That was, I think, in Guiyang City, in Guizhou. So that was southwest China. So now I think the this, this situation is okay. very serious in entire China. All right. So you're saying that uh, it's a serious situation across China. Anand, uh, coming back to you, uh, do you see uh, the, the Chinese government taking any such measures? Yes, there is a certain amount of euphoria, happiness about the economy opening up. People can go to malls. They can travel openly. But at the same time, there is a fear that the controls have been eased too quickly. Uh, could we see some measures being taken by the Chinese government? And also, do you expect some sort of retaliation against India and other nations who have started imposing uh, some amount of curbs, testing curbs on travelers coming from China? Well, Parikshit, there were new uh, health protocols. The 10th edition of health protocols was released in Beijing just today. So I don't think uh, from what we see from those protocols, it's more easing. And I don't think they are going to go back to putting restrictions uh, that we've seen here for the last two, three years. It seems to me that I think their best sort of hope is to let it spread as quickly as possible to achieve herd immunity and to get people back at work and the economy back ticking by the second quarter of next year, since probably Q1 of 2023 will be a write-off. So I think their best sort of hope is to just get it over with and kind of metaphorically rip the Band-Aid off, uh, so to speak, uh, even though that's going to be in uh, mass deaths among elderly in the short term. 
Uh, and I think that in terms of uh, measures that they've warned, uh, it's difficult to see what they will do, Parikshit, because even with China's opening on January 8th to international travelers, uh, China itself is requiring all foreign arrivals to take PCR mm. tests before traveling to China. And that is the, the requirement that other nations are asking of Chinese travelers. Uh, so in that sense, I think some officials that I've spoken to from other countries are a little bit puzzled, given that China itself is going to be asking for that requirement. Uh, but at the same time, I right. think that uh, Parikshit health experts are saying that so far, there have been no new variants discovered in China. I know there's been some alarm about this in India, uh, but the reason for the spread, uh, most cases here have actually been mild. But the reason it spread so fast is because it's essentially mm. a first wave nationally in China, and it's a population with low immunity. It's not that okay. so far, at least, and hopefully you won't see a worse variant that's emerged. Uh, but so far, that hasn't happened yet, uh, Parikshit. That's something right. that we should also note. All right, uh, we've run out of time, but uh, Anand Krishnan, Jennifer Zing, thank you very much for joining us here on Global Eye and explaining us the worrying state of affairs with the COVID outbreak in China. With that, it's a wrap of this edition of Global Eye. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.